The Texas Debates Race for Governor is presented by AARP, now offering a voter's guide online to inform voters about the issues and the candidates. The guide and more information are available at aarp.org tx. The Texas Debates Race for Governor is brought to you by KERA, NBC5, Telemundo 39, The Dallas Morning News, the Texas Association of Broadcasters, other partners, and Texas Public Media Stations. Welcome to the Texas Debates Race for Governor. We're broadcasting live from the KERA studios in Dallas and online at texasdebates.org. I'm KERA's Shelley Koffler, and I'll be the moderator during the next hour as we bring you the last statewide televised debate between the leading candidates for governor. Elect me as governor and I will get Texas moving again. 56-year-old Greg Abbott is the Republican nominee for governor. He worked as a lawyer in Houston after receiving a law degree from Vanderbilt University. Abbott was elected as a state district judge and a Texas Supreme Court justice before winning his current seat as attorney general in 2002. I am running because I'll be a governor who will fight for every single hardworking Texan, not just some. 51-year-old Wendy Davis is the Democratic nominee for governor. She's a Fort Worth attorney with a degree from Harvard Law School. Davis served on the Fort Worth City Council before voters elected her to her current seat as a Texas state senator in 2009. And thanks to both of you for being with us tonight. We appreciate your coming. You'll be answering questions from each other and also questions from a panelist of journalists. Gromer Jeffers with the Dallas Morning News. Brian Curtis from NBC5. Peggy Fekak with the San Antonio Express News and the Houston Chronicle. And Norma Garcia from Telemundo 39, she's going to have social media questions that have been submitted by the public. And you can join the debate on Twitter. Just tweet at KERA News, hashtag Texas Debates. We'll be sharing some of your comments during the broadcast. Now for this first set of questions, candidates are going to have a minute to respond and then an opportunity for rebuttal. Uh, based on a coin toss, Attorney General Abbott, you will get the first question and that question comes from Brian Curtis. Good evening to both of you. Good evening. Good evening, Brian. Tonight, the eyes of the nation are on Texas and Dallas with the news that the first Ebola patient diagnosed here in the United States is here. Attorney General Abbott, if you were governor today, please outline the immediate steps that you would take to protect the people of Texas. Uh, as governor, I would do what I did earlier today, and, and that is to speak uh, with the commissioner uh, of Health and Human Services here in the state of Texas. Do that first uh, to, to find out what our game plan is and where we are going. Uh, I learned that uh, the Texas uh, hospital uh, plan uh, is one of the, the few locations in the country uh, that is prepared to deal uh, with Ebola. Uh, and the commissioner here in the state of Texas uh, is working with the CDC uh, to ensure that uh, this situation is properly addressed. We need to understand uh, both the concerns that people at home have, uh, as well as uh, the health of, of the person who has uh, or may have this disease. But we've seen already uh, the in innovative ways in which the United States is able to come up with drug therapies that can effectively treat and even eliminate this disease. So we are, we're proud that we are national leaders in this effort, but as governor, I will ensure that we employ Time. every possibility to keep Texans safe. Senator Davis, if you were governor today, please outline the immediate steps that you would take to protect the people of Texas. Of course. Well, first, Brian, my sympathies go out to the person who's been affected by this disease and the people who love this patient. I had an opportunity earlier this evening to speak with our Dallas County judge here, Judge Jenkins, and he reassured me that with the world-class hospital system here, they have in place the protocols to make sure that medical professionals who treat this patient will be safe and that they will be able to contain this disease. He asked that we consider helping our public community to remain calm. This is not an airborne disease. And we talked about the coordinated effort that should and will occur between the county 
the state, and the federal CDC in order to assure that we're taking all precautions necessary not to see further incidences of this disease in our community. As governor, that coordination would be my primary purpose and of course Time. helping the public to understand and to remain calm. We will now give each of you another 45 seconds in the same order for rebuttal if you choose to use it. Brian? Attorney General Abbott, under what circumstances might a quarantine be necessary? Where would the threshold be for you? Well, I, I think the threshold uh, has been met right now. We want to ensure uh, that this uh, Ebola disease cannot expand any further. It's my understanding that, uh, for example, the, the ambulance uh, that transported the person has already been quarantined. Uh, we need to make sure that anyone who's been exposed to this is going to be quarantined. Uh, I think one of the first and foremost obligations of our state and of our nation is to ensure uh, that this disease does not spread any further whatsoever and that we bring uh, to bear uh, the medicines that were able uh, to cure those doctors who came back to the United States last month and ensure that we're able to uh, eliminate this disease for the person who has it now, but ensure that others don't contract it. Senator Davis, where is the threshold for you on quarantine? Again, as I discussed with Judge Jenkins this evening, there will be and is already a quarantine in place for this particular patient and protocols are being followed to assure the safety of the medical professionals that will be treating the patient. Of course, utilizing those resources and drugs available to us that we know successfully treated other medical professionals who had been in West Africa helping to treat Ebola patients uh, will be administered to this patient is very, very important. But as soon as we know that we have someone who is suffering from this disease, an immediate quarantine of, is of course necessary and called for. Okay, thanks to both of you. Our second question now goes to Senator Davis first and it comes from Gromer Jeffers. Senator Davis, there's not a topic that gets parents and teachers more angry than standardized, standardized tests. Now, uh, both of you say that you would cut the number of, sta of standardized student tests. But how should test results be used? And to what extent should test scores be used to determine whether a, a student graduates or is, advances to the next level? I have been a leader in making sure that we reduce standardized testing in this state. And in fact, was a co-author of a bill last session to reduce from our high school students 15 end of course exams to five. It's now time for us to decrease those pressures in middle and lower school grades as well. Tests are important measures to determine where students' strengths and weaknesses are, and they should be used for that purpose so that teachers can understand where the holes are and what they need to do to help fill them. I, unlike my opponent, would never advocate the idea that we expand the use of standardized tests to four-year-olds. However, he's laid out a plan for his pre-K funding program that would include the use of those standardized tools in children as young as four years old. Mr. Abbott, how would you use? Well, Go ahead. Sure. Uh, first, Grummer, if, if I could, let me uh, respond and clarify and make sure that, that people understand that, that contrary to what Senator Davis said, uh, I no more uh, want four-year-olds to take standardized tests and I want a cow to jump over the moon. The reality of what I want to achieve in education is to ensure uh, that we build a strong foundation for education for our children beginning at pre-K-4, going all the way through third grade, ensuring that every child in the state of Texas is going to be able to read and do math at or above grade level by the time they finish the third grade. Gromer, I've seen this firsthand. Uh, my wife has been both a teacher and a principal. We've seen the ways that education can transform the lives of children so they can achieve things their parents couldn't even dream of. The way we do that, Gromer, is by placing trust where it belongs, and that is with our teachers, as opposed to these one-size-fits-all mandates time. from Austin, Texas. Senator Davis. In, this in is your, our rebuttal time, Gromer. Yes, in, in your rebuttal, how much weight should standardized tests have in the evaluation of teachers? They should play some role determining whether students are increasing their performance levels. 
but not the high stakes standardized tests that we have in place today. It is important to make sure that we're measuring student performance, but that we're not discouraging good teachers from going into classrooms that will be helping the most challenging of students, those that making tremendous progress, though they can't show incredible success on a standardized test, should still be rewarded. Teachers should be rewarded for showing that progress with their students. I disagree with Mr. Abbott. His plan on page 21 calls for standardized testing of our four-year-olds. And I can tell you in my time on the campaign trail and in all my years in the Texas Senate, I have never had a parent tell me that they think we need more standardized tests, not less. I will fight to make sure that we have fewer standardized tests across the board in Texas and that the high pressure time. that has been associated with them goes away. Mr. Attorney General. Sure, Gromer. Uh, what I'd like to urge everyone to do uh, is to go to gregabbott.com. Uh, you can check out my education plan where uh, what I want to do is, unlike what any other governor has talked about doing before, I want to genuinely elevate the Texas education system to be ranked number one in the nation. We do that by starting with the fundamental building blocks for reading and writing from the very beginning. We continue that by providing tools and technologies to students so they are able to get plugged in to the most advanced learning opportunities, but also so they are prepared for the high paying jobs of the future. Gomer, with regard to evaluation of teachers, I think it is important that decisions like that be made at local control. Part of my plan that you will find at gregabbott.com will, an entire division of it, focuses on returning education where it should be, and that is at the local level. My plan will lead us there and will lead us to be ranked number one in the nation Thank you, for educating Tom. our children. Okay. Well, we've been asking the public to email and tweet questions for the candidates, so we're going to go now to Norma Garcia, who has a question from one of our viewers. Yes, let me tell you, we have received hundreds of questions via social media, and we will continue to receive them throughout the debate. You can see many of them at the bottom of the screen. Tweet us right now, K-E-R-A News, hashtag Texas Debates. And our first question comes from Marta. She lives in Fort Worth. <coughs> the question is, what is your position on providing driver's permits for undocumented immigrants. Uh, Attorney General Abbott, there is uh, an effort to reintroduce a bill that would provide driver's permits to undocumented immigrants. This would be a state ID could not be used for federal purposes. Would you support that bill? Yes, no, and why? Norma, Norma we, we've seen, or, or I guess it's Martha who's asking that question. Uh, we have seen problems uh, with laws like that uh, uh, be challenged, if you would, by the Federal Real ID Act. Uh, I think that uh, before we go down the pathway uh, of trying to uh, create uh, these differentiated uh, types of driver's licenses, we need to make sure uh, <coughs> that we are complying with federal law and not providing licenses uh, that others could use for inappropriate purposes. Senator Davis, uh, would you, you have said you would be in favor of providing driver's permits. Why should undocumented immigrants get special treatment? And do you think this could create a registry of second class individuals? I do, do not believe it creates special treatment for undocumented immigrants. Instead, what it addresses is a very real challenge in our state. The fact that people are driving on our roads across this state today who do not have the appropriate training and who are not insured. Unless we as a state create some system that provides a driver permit for every driver on the road, we cannot assure those two things. Other states have successfully done this, requiring in exchange for that permit, special training to make sure that we have safe drivers on the road and proof of insurance. In my time as a Texas Senator and before that as a city council person, I heard repeatedly from people who were involved in accidents with uninsured drivers in many instances who were not in our state or our country legally. And I believe these driver permits and the accompanying requirement of insurance is important to keep all drivers safe on the road. We now have time for rebuttals, Norma. What should undocumented immigrants who want to abide by the rule and uh, have insurance do in the meantime? Attorney General. 
Well, you really raised the pivotal question, and, and that is we are dealing with the challenge, whether it be with driver's licenses or so many other issues, uh, we're dealing with undocumented individuals. And so the problem, whether it be to Marta or whomever, this problem is never going to be fixed as long as we have the broken immigration system that we have. If we want to fix the problem about ensuring uh, that those who are here are driving safely on the road with a driver's license, what we really need to do is to fix our broken immigration system. Once we do that, then all of these peripheral issues will get resolved. Senator Davis, what should the state do in the meantime with undocumented immigrants who need to drive? I support comprehensive immigration reform and making sure that if people are willing to pass a background check, learn English and pay back taxes owed in our state that they have a path to become a legal worker here. It is modeled after President George Bush's plan. But let's face it, we are not going to see that happen anytime soon because Congress has failed to do its job to pass that kind of reform. I believe that Texas can't wait and that in this next legislative session, we do need to address the issue of making sure that every driver on our road has proper training and is insured to keep other drivers on our road safe. Okay, thank you very much. We're going to return to questions for both of our candidates, but right now we want to spend a little time and talk with both of you about something is, that is relevant uh, with respect to your serving as governor. So right now, Peggy Fikak has the first conversation with Senator Davis. Senator, you and Attorney General Abbott both have focused on ethics in this campaign. I'd like to ask about the intersection of your public office and your private business. On the Fort Worth City Council, you sometimes voted on projects that used your title business. As a senator, you voted on North Texas Tollway Authority legislation while the authority was a client of your law firm. And now as a candidate, you've done a book tour that's prompted an ethics complaint from your opponent. You say you've acted properly. Do critics have a right to say you should have gone further to avoid any appearance of a conflict? I have always acted within the ethical guidelines and have been very careful to do so. First and foremost, <coughs> as a public servant, my job has always been, and my duty has always been to the people that I represent. It is not a surprise to me that General Abbott has brought these accusations forward in a myriad of ways to try to divert attention from his own failed record, a record where he has sold out hardworking Texans time and time again in the interests of people who make donations to his campaign. Whether that is chemical companies who have given him over $100,000 and then received a ruling from him that they could now keep secret the location of their dangerous chemicals. Whether it's payday lenders who have t given him $300,000 and then received a ruling from him that they can operate in a loophole in the law that allows them to charge unlimited rates and fees. Whether it's taking money from the hospital board uh, chair uh, when there was a, a, a surgeon operating under that uh, administration okay, and harming and hurting many patients and taking money and then siding with that hospital. We see it over and over again. Senator, could I ask you to address the question about your own dealings, if you, if you would, please? Yes, and as I said, I have always operated within the ethical requirements, and I've been very careful to do so at every level of government that I have served. I think that people who know me and know my record know this, that I fight for the people that I represent, that I put the hardworking Texans that I represent first and foremost in everything that I do, and that I have been willing to stand up to the biggest, baddest bullies in the world in order to fight for them. That is why I am in public office. That is my record as a public servant, and I'm very proud of that record. Time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peggy. Um, we now have a question about ethics as well for you, uh, Attorney General Abbott. Your critics claim that there's been a pattern of you using your Attorney General's office to reward political contributors. The most recent situation involves the Texas Enterprise Fund, which has been in the news this week. It was designed to assist companies that will create jobs. Last week, we learned that you received more than a million dollars in campaign donations from parties who received money from that fund even though an auditor says that some never formally applied for the money 
and they didn't necessarily prove or could prove that they would create new jobs. Uh, state law requires you as attorney general to oversee the fund. So I'm wondering, did you know millions of taxpayer dollars were being handed out without adequate scrutiny? And if you didn't, why didn't you know? Shelly, I think that uh, no politician is above the law. And frankly, I'm pleased uh, that the state auditor conducted an independent investigation to look at every last detail about what happened. And after that independent investigation by the state auditor, he wrote a report. And in that report, it, it numbered, I think, 107 pages. And in that 107 pages where the auditor looked uh, at the conduct about the fund and the conduct of the governor, as well as the conduct of myself in my office, there was nothing in there critical of either me or my office. What he did say, however, is that there was no scrutiny for a lot of these uh, awards. Should there have been? And why didn't we know? Why didn't you know? First, uh, it, there have been different iterations or time periods of the law that allowed this funding. When the funding was first allowed, the way the legislature constructed it, there were no rules or regulations uh, that limited. Didn't anybody speak up? They did speak up. Two years later, uh, when the legislature decided, wait a second, we need to place some more controls on this. And that is when it was reformed. And uh, so those reforms uh, helped put it on a better place. But I think there's, there's a bigger point that needs to be made here. Because as you know, from the beginning of my campaign, I have been questioning this very fund and its purposes let, and uses. Let me go back to one thing, though, that reporters really want to hear you answer tonight, and that is <clears throat> your agency told reporters who looked into the applications for the Enterprise Fund money that they couldn't see them because there was confidential information in them. We now know that in at least five cases where you were denying access to the applications, there weren't any applications. Can you explain that? Why deny access to something that doesn't exist? Sure. Uh, First, uh, our office did issue an opinion uh, based on an open records decision uh, that certain of that information could not be disclosed because of laws passed by the legislature that prohibited them from being disclosed. However, our office ruled that other parts of that information could be disclosed. But there were no applications. Well, if, if you go back and look, uh, you will see that what has been released uh, is a letter uh, uh, that's about nine or ten pages long uh, that is the equivalent of an application. But, but Shelley, this, this is very important because at that time there was no prescription for an application and that is one of the things that the legislature corrected. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we now go back to our questions for both of you and the next question comes from Brian and it goes first to Senator Davis. You both say that Texas children deserve a first-class education, but Texas ranks 46th in the nation when it comes to the amount of money we spend on each student, about $9,000. That's almost $500 less per student than we spent just a few years ago. Senator Davis, we know you support more funding for education. What is the price tag for your education plans? Please give us a dollar amount, and where would you find that money? Brian, I was proud in 2011 to filibuster the $5.4 billion in cuts to our public schools. Cuts that my opponent has been fighting in court to keep in place ever since. Cuts that he told a TV audience last week that he had to continue to pursue when that's absolutely not the truth. My plan calls for investing in making sure that every four-year-old in this state has access to quality full-day pre-K, that we pay our teachers more in line with national average, that we dramatically reduce standardized tests, and that we create better access to early college high school and dual credit classes. That comes at a price. But the question to ask is, at what price will we pay as a state if we don't? I will set a vision for this legislature to begin to move in that direction. It will not happen overnight, but it is essential for the future of this state Tell that me. it does happen. Attorney General Abbott, 
You say you want the number one education system in the country. How much additional money per student, if any, would your plan require and where would that money come from? Brian, the, the amount additional per student varies from program to program. For example, uh, in my pre-K-4 program that I want to elevate to be uh, the premier high quality pre-K program in America, uh, I want to add $1,500 more per student. But you also need to look at the big picture here. The amount that we are going to spend on education in the next biennium in the state of Texas is going to be $60 billion. It's a huge number. So the important thing is that we be wise and strategic about how we dedicate that funding. Where I want to dedicate that funding is first and foremost on building a solid foundation for education uh, at the very beginning from pre-K all the way through third grade. Second is I do want to invest in teachers. I want to ensure that teachers both have the resources, the training, and the salaries to ensure we have the best top quality teachers in America. Time. Rebuttal. Senator Davis, I still didn't hear a dollar amount from you. Do you have one? Mr. Abbott, you are talking out of both sides of your mouth. On the one hand, you are fighting to keep our students in overcrowded classrooms, teachers laid off across the state, and school closings in place. And yet you say you want to make Texas number one in education. You cannot accomplish that goal without making the appropriate investments. And when you talk about local control, what you really mean is exactly what's been happening today. Pushing those costs down to the local level, increasing property taxes for families across this state, and unfortunately keeping their children in a situation where they're not getting the education that they deserve. Your pre-K plan will pick Time. and choose which children get quality pre-K and which do not, and it Time. does not uh, offer full day pre-K. So no dollar amount. As I said, Brian, this is a vision that will be set for the legislature. And it has to be looked at in two very important ways. If we fail to invest, and by the way, I did file a bill to change the school funding formula in the last legislative session that would increase per pupil funding. If we do not make those investments, we know that we're going to continue Thank exactly you. where we are today. Attorney Thank you. General Texas. Abbott. I, we're going to give Attorney General Abbott a little extra time too. Yes. Okay. Uh, the amount of money that you're talking about increasing spending per pupil still does not get us to the national average, which is about $11,000. Should we be at least at the national average on spending per pupil? Brian, I, I actually think that we need to look at, look at it from the opposite direction. The, the way that you are looking at it and the way that you're focusing on it is the way that a lot of people do. And that is they say, well, how much should we spend? Let me tell you, no business starts out by saying, well, well, gosh, we need to spend X amount and then create a product. Brian, what we really need to do is we need to create the best school system in America and then fund it. So before we talk about the dollar amount, we need to talk about what we are providing for the students in the classroom. My plan that I've rolled out creates the best classroom environment for students in the United States of America from pre-K all the way through graduation. So With you no believe funding that we can it. create the number one education system in the nation by spending below the national average per pupil? Let me give you- an, Let's an, answer this quickly, please. Sure. Thank you. E easy example that will put it into perspective, and that is, California spends a lot more per pupil than does the state of Texas. Despite that fact, Texas students perform as well, if not better, on NAEP test. And so it shows more spending doesn't always lead to better results. Thank you very much. Uh, our next question comes from Gromer Jeffers, and it goes first to Attorney General Abbott. Attorney General Abbott, a, a whole bunch of conservative states rejected Obamacare. But several of them came up with plans to use those federal dollars to create their own flexible systems to cover the uninsured. Right now, Texas is turning its back on $100 billion in federal money. If elected governor, would you be willing to negotiate with the federal, gover with the federal government on a plan that lowers premiums as well as uh, lowers the, reduces the local tax burden? Or would you, like Governor Perry, refuse to talk to Washington and make a deal? Well, 
Grummer, what I think is, is the best strategy for the state of Texas would be for the state of Texas to be able to get a block grant where we would have that level of flexibility so we could address uh, the unique health care challenges that the people of the state of Texas face. We know, Grummer, that these bureaucrats in Washington, D.C., they don't know how to address me, our health care uh, problems. Uh, let me just here. say, I hate to cut you off, but That's some right. conservatives, even in the legislature, say block grants aren't a practical solution. Block grants have been used effectively in states like Rhode Island, in Indiana, and I think they can be used now. But, but Grummer, let's, let's even get beyond this. I have laid out strategies in which I will improve health care spending on areas where we can genuinely improve people's lives. I want to increase spending on women's health care. I want to increase spending for veterans, for the disabled, for mental health needs. But what I don't want to do is to bankrupt Texas by imposing on Texas uh, the overwhelming Obamacare Time. disaster. Senator, Senator Davis, uh, if elected governor, you will be dealing with an overwhelmingly Republican legislature, unless Democrats get everything they want in November. How would you bring $100 billion to Texas? You know, this is an issue about doing the right thing for the people of this state. I have to laugh when I hear uh, Mr. Abbott talk about bankrupting Texas. Right now, Texans are writing hard-earned tax dollars to the IRS, $100 billion of which will never come back to work for us in our state unless we bring it back. As governor, I will bring it back. Greg Abbott's plan is to have you write that tax check and send it to California and New York. He is California's best friend in Texas. But there is a reason Republican governors around this state have found a solution to bring that money to their states. There's a reason that chambers of commerce around this state have all come forward begging us to do the right thing and bring that money back to work for us. It will create an estimated 300,000 jobs per <coughs> year in our state. A true leader stops partisan posturing and does the right thing for her state and brings her tax dollars Thank back you. to work for her community. Okay, time for rebuttal. Attorney General sure. Abbott, the if county judges for the six largest counties in this state want some sort of solution. It, it's important for the people at home to understand this. If, if anyone believes uh, that California is getting a penny more money because Texas is not participating in Obamacare, uh, then they are the same people who believe uh, the phrase by the president, if you like your doctor, you'll get to keep your doctor. Let me tell you the facts. Uh, the, the facts are uh, that Texas, uh, by not participating in Obamacare, is California is not going to get one single penny more. Another fact is if Texas does partic participate in Obamacare, it will cost the taxpayers of Texas more than $10 billion during the first 10 years of implementation. But even worse <coughs> is that if Texas participates, we are making a deal with a federal government that is $18 trillion in debt. That is a Time. bargain Thank I'm you. not willing to make as governor. Senator Thank Davis, you. you're chuckling and shaking your well, head. Well, what Mr. Abbott's saying is just absolutely not true. Our tax dollars will go to supplement health care in California and New York if we do not bring them back here. Our check that we write to the IRS will not get any smaller. And in fact, the checks that we write for our property taxes will grow. There's a reason that Republican and Democratic county judges around this state have come together and unified around the idea of bringing that tax money back to work for us because they know that their hospital districts will have to increase taxes in order to take care of that unfunded care. Studies show that our investment to bring those dollars down will yield a net tremendous positive benefit for this state, including the job Thank creation you, that will come from it. Okay, thanks to both of you. We're going to shift gears now and we're going to give the candidates, each of you, an opportunity to ask each other a question. We've flipped a coin and we'll start with Attorney General Abbott, who has a question for Senator Davis. Well, the, the timing could hardly be better for this question. Uh, I noticed that you said recently that, that you want to impose Obamacare on the people of Texas so badly that even if the conservative Texas legislature would not vote to approve it, you would go around the legislature and use an executive order to impose Obamacare on the people of Texas. So Senator, my question to you is, what part of the Texas Constitution 
gives the governor the authority to go around the legislature and use an executive order to impose a law like Obamacare. What I've argued, Mr. Abbott, is that we should bring Medicaid expansion to Texas. Medicaid expansion is all about bringing our tax dollars back to work for us. And as a member of the Texas legislature, I can tell you that every hospital association, every chamber of commerce member and Republicans alike in our Texas legislature agreed that we should do the right thing by our state and bring that money back to work for us. What I've also said is that Medicaid expansion included the authority to bring it to states through executive order. But what I would prefer to do and what I will do is work with my legislature, Republicans and Democrats alike, who know that this is the right thing to do for their communities, who aren't afraid of being labeled as partisans and who are more interested mm -hmm. in doing right by their citizens. And I'll work with them to bring their tax dollars, our community tax dollars, back to Texas and to keep property taxes from increasing. There is no question, no question whatsoever, that if we don't bring this money back down to work for us, our citizens across this state are going to pay twice, once to the IRS with money they'll never see again, and another time at the local level because someone will have to pay you. for the unfunded care somehow, some way. Thank you. Senator Davis, it is now your turn to ask a question of Attorney General Abbott. Mr. Abbott, uh, your ruling regarding the Texas Enterprise Fund kept secret the fact that tens of millions of dollars had been awarded from the Texas Enterprise Fund to companies who didn't even apply. My question for you tonight is, will you agree to release any documentation any communications that represent communications that you had during that time in reaching that decision? You know, Senator, I actually think that you may be able to help in answering this question. Because if I recall correctly, one of the beneficiaries uh, of that enterprise fund whose application cannot be found was Cabela's in Fort Worth. When you were a councilwoman on the Fort Worth City Council, you used taxpayer incentive dollars to attract Cabela there, and that Cabela benefited from the Texas Enterprise Fund. There is, however, one thing that you haven't disclosed. It's the fact that when you used those incentive funds to attract Cabela and then close the deal, it was your title company that benefited by closing that deal. So you personally profited. You were Mr. able to Abbott, use your I title not, company. You are, your, you are not telling the truth right now and you know you are not telling the truth. I did not personally profit from that. And in fact, we did actually have an application that we reviewed very carefully. And we also, unlike what your office did, clawed back when Cabela's failed to realize the job creation numbers that they promised. Because as has always been the case with me, my obligation is to the hardworking people that I represent. And when private partners don't come through on their promises, I make sure that our public dollars are clawed back. You were the chief law enforcement officer over the Enterprise Fund. It was your responsibility to Time. make sure that the tens of millions of dollars that were going to these companies Time. were resulting in jobs. And you failed to do that. And then not only did you do it, you covered Time, up the fact that in many instances Time, they were given money without even applying for those monies. Okay, well, that's time, but we do want to give you an opportunity to respond if you choose to. Sure, uh, I would like to respond by knowing how much your title company received by closing the Cabela's deal that was granted an award from the Texas Enterprise Fund. It was not my title company. I was an employee of a title company earning a salary that was never dependent on any deal that ever closed. Mr. Abbott, this is about your failure, your failure as the chief law enforcement officer of this state to review and make sure that these funds weren't being used as slush funds okay. for your donors. And yet you took $1.4 million Thank dollars in donations from people who Thank received you. monies 
from the Texas Enterprise Fund, and you're going to move on. Looked the other way. Okay, we're going to move on. We have a question now. Peggy Fikak has a question. It goes first to you, Senator Davis. Um, on a different uh, different issue, traffic is a headache around the state. Um, even if voters approve more money for roads in November, transportation officials say they'll need another two to three billion dollars just to maintain the current level of congestion. How do you raise that money, and would you take new toll roads or higher tolls off the table in coming up with the money that's needed? Peggy, I have long been a leader in the area of transportation in this community and in the Texas Senate. I served for eight years on the Regional Transportation Council and six years on the Senate Transportation Committee, and I was proud to be a co-author of what our voters will vote on in November, Proposition 1, something that my opponent let go by for about a year, I believe, before he weighed in on supporting it. I'm encouraging voters to support use of their rainy day monies for purposes of transportation. I also have a plan. Mr. Abbott may have a 30-second commercial, but I have a plan to gradually end the diversions that are coming from the gasoline tax, and I submitted that plan in the form of a bill last session. That plan would allow us to capture an additional four to five billion dollars with a gradual step down and a plan to fill the hole where those diversions would end. <clears throat> would you say tolls are off the table or are they part of the time potentially? Uh, can we want to wait for rebuttal on that or okay General Abbott? I think I have a good commercial. <laughs> My commercial shows uh, that me in a wheelchair I can go faster than some of the people in cars on the roads here in Dallas or other large cities across the state. Peggy, to, to answer your question, I have a plan that will add more than $4 billion to building roads in the state without raising a single penny in taxes, fees, or tolls. Where this money comes from is from three places. One, we stop the diversions away uh, from funding that was intended for building roads. Money that is dedicated to roads should be spent on building roads. Two, uh, we take part of the oil and gas severance tax and dedicate that to building roads. Three, we take part of the sales taxes that you're already paying when you buy a car or truck and use it to build roads that those cars and trucks are driving on. Could each of you address whether you think tolls new toll roads or higher tolls should be part of the mix when you're looking at transportation needs in Texas? I believe that it's been a poor solution for Texans to have to pay twice. They're paying at the gasoline pump and then they have to pay again to drive on toll roads. And they're doing that because we haven't had leadership in the Texas legislature that's provided other alternatives for building them. I'm glad to hear that Mr. Abbott approves and agrees with my plans. The rainy day fund money that comes from oil and gas severance taxes is Proposition 1 that I co-authored and that voters will be voting on in November. The end to diversions is a bill that I filed in the last legislative session, but my plan includes a way to replace the hole that's left by ending those diversions because right now much of that money is going to education and health and human services. I do believe you, that we Senator. need to go back to a pay-as-you-go system as a state and Thank get you. out of the heavy debt load that our state is carrying for transportation costs. Attorney General Abbott, would you take tolls off the table? Short and simple, my plan does not involve any toll roads, period. And you wouldn't add that to your plan? I, 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 I am not interested in adding toll roads in my plan. Okay, thank you. I have the next question. It will go first to Attorney General Abbott. In the past year, Texas home insurance companies have imposed some very big rate increases, as much as 30% by one company, while still collecting fairly sizable profits. We have a system in this state, as you know, that allows companies to increase their insurance rates before they're actually reviewed. Do you think rates in this state are too high for homeowners? And if so, what changes would you make? There's probably not a homeowner at home who doesn't think that the rates are too high. And uh, Shelley, I do think uh, that we need to find ways uh, to reduce homeowner insurance rates. Uh, it seems like they're going through the roof, uh, no pun intended, but the reality is we have to have a marketplace that will attract the insurance companies here to provide that homeowner insurance. 
And so, uh, do you think rates are, are adequate? Are they right where they need to be, or? I mean, candidly, uh, I haven't looked at the math of it. Uh, I think it's called actuarial information, and I haven't looked at the actuarial information. So, uh, mathematically, I can't tell you. What I can tell you, as a homeowner myself, uh, as a person who talks to homeowners every day, we all want to find ways that we can drive down uh, the cost of our homeowner insurance. And uh, I will be someone who will be a champion for homeowners to find those types of solutions. And I want to say before we go to you, Senator, we won't be having rebuttals on the last few questions because we're running really tight on time. Uh, but Senator, the same thing, are the rates too high? And if so, what would you do about it? The them? rates are ridiculously high. Homeowners are being gouged in our state. And they're being gouged in our state because we have an insurance commissioner who is failing to do her job and responsibly review these rate increases and decline them. As a state senator, I have argued that we should have prior approval of rate increases in our state before they are allowed. And one of the first things I will do as governor is replace the insurance commissioner and put someone there who has as her number one responsibility, the hardworking people of this state. I don't cotton to people who sell out our hardworking Texans for the interests of big insurance companies. Mr. Abbott, on the other hand, has taken enormous contributions from them and most recently advocated a settlement on behalf of Farmers Insurance that the judge accused him of laying down to the insurance company and refused to accept the settlement because he was selling out the claimants in our state. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. We're now going to go to Norma uh, Garcia and she has another social media question. Again, there won't be a rebuttal on this one. There is still time to join the conversation. We're getting lots of questions via Twitter. So tweet us right now at KERA News, hashtag Texas Debates. And our next question is uh, the following. If a 10-year-old girl asked you whether her two dads should be allowed to get married, what would you tell her? Senator Davis, you are for gay marriage. Would you, as governor, repeal the constitutional provision or push to repeal the constitutional provision that makes gay marriage illegal in Texas, yes or no? And how high is this topic in your list of priorities? I, fairy, I favor, pardon me, Norm, I favor marriage equality. And I wanna make sure that people who love each other, who are willing to be in a committed relationship with each other and who desire to marry in our state have the opportunity to do so. This is a constitutional provision in our law right now, but it's been challenged. It's been challenged by Mr. Abbott, and we await the court's decision on whether this actually is in keeping with the U.S. constitutional and the equal protection clause of that constitution. If this is not remedied in the courts, as governor, I will be happy and will welcome a bill that would allow us to put once again before the voters of this state a decision on whether to repeal <clears throat> what is currently our constitutional ban against marriage equality in this state. Attorney General, you are leading the fight against gay marriage. What would you say to that child? Mm -hmm. John, uh, I want you to know that there are good and decent people on both sides of this issue. I believe in traditional marriage. That's what 75% of Texans agreed with less than a decade ago when they passed a constitutional amendment in the state of Texas saying that uh, marriage in Texas is a union between one man and one woman. Now, for me personally, this is more than a constitutional amendment. I've been married uh, to my wife, Cecilia, for more than 33 years now. Is that what you would tell to the 10-year-old? That's what I just told John. Okay, thank you. Okay, we now have a question from Brian, and this uh, question goes first to Attorney General Abbott. I'd like to ask each of you to clarify your position on an issue that's been front and center since the start of this campaign, and that is abortion. Attorney General Abbott, you have said that abortion is only acceptable to save a woman's life. You have also indicated that you oppose abortion even in cases of rape and incest. Please speak directly to every woman in Texas who has been a victim of rape or incest, and explain your position. Brian, it's incredibly important. Whenever we talk to a woman who's a victim of rape or incest, uh, that we start with the compassion and support they deserve. That's what I have done 
as Attorney General uh, by providing a record amount of financial support to victims and victims organizations supporting women who've been victims of rape and incest. That's what I've done as Attorney General by arresting more sexual predators than all attorneys general in the history of the state of Texas. But you, you bring up the issue, and listen, you, you know uh, that I'm pro-life uh, and I'm Catholic, and I want to promote a culture of life that supports both the health and safety of both the mother and child, both before and after birth. In Texas, let's be clear about the law, and that is a woman has five months to make a very difficult decision. Thank you very much. Senator Davis? Senator Davis, you, you catapulted into the spotlight on this issue with your filibuster against abortion restrictions. But you recently told the editorial board of the Dallas Morning News that you might not have filibustered if the legislation only banned abortions after 20 weeks with allowances for rape and incest. What kind of abortion restrictions are you willing to accept? I have always believed, Brian, that it is for a woman and a woman guided by her faith and her family and her doctor to make these very difficult decisions for themselves. I do not believe that the government should intrude in that most personal and private of decision makings. Greg Abbott, on the other hand, believes that it is his right to intrude, even when a woman has been the brutal victim of a rape, a brutal rape, or has been the victim of incest. This should come as no surprise to us, given that Mr. Abbott's attitudes toward women have revealed themselves in other ways. He pays women in his office less than he pays male assistant attorney generals. He campaigned with a known sexual predator who has bragged about having sex with underage girls. What about your position? Thank you. Though? We have time for one more question. I do apologize. We are running very close on time. And for this question from Gromer, which goes first to Senator Davis, we'll only have 45 seconds for each answer, but we'll uh, we'll see what we can do with that. Senator Davis, Senator Davis, as you know, Texas has a law that allows undocumented immigrant students to pay in-state tuition. <clears throat> uh, why allow undocumented students such a benefit? And does the law encourage the flow of undocumented immigrants into Texas? It's good for our economy to make sure that every person who lives here has an opportunity to be a vibrant part of the Texas economy. During this campaign, I've met so many extraordinary young people who are dreamers, who are here working hard to become something. A young woman named Danny, who I met at the Texas State Technical College, who is working on becoming a teacher. She graduated in the top 10% of her high school class. My opponent has called the DREAM Act flawed. I support the DREAM Act. And if there is any attempt to repeal it, and I am sitting at the governor's desk, I will veto that attempt. It makes sense for our students. It makes sense for our economy to make sure that every student in Texas you, can be a successful part of our future. Thank you, Senator. Attorney, Attorney General, General Abbott. You did say the, the law was a noble effort, but flawed. Would you veto a bill from the legislature that repeals this law? Well, frankly, as, as Senator Davis was saying, I, I think uh, that the goals of the law are noble. But to, to make clear, I think that the flaw, uh, that the law as it's structured is flawed because the way that it's supposed to work uh, is that a student is supposed to be showing that they're making progress toward establishing legal status. And that simply is not being done. But Gromer, here's the real deal. And that is, all these laws, like the in-state tuition law, those are, are only symptoms of a larger problem. The larger problem, Gromer, is we have a broken immigration system. Okay. Would, you, thank you. Would you veto? Thank you. Would you veto? Thank you. Until we fix our immigration system. Veto? Yes or no? I, 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 I'm say it again. Veto a, a bill from the legislature, legislature that repeals the law. Yes or no? Would I veto it? No. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Sorry, I wish we had more time for that, but uh, we'd now like to give each of you an opportunity to make a closing statement, and based on a coin toss, Senator Davis, yours will be first. Thank you. The question that people will have to ask themselves in this election is, who will fight for me? I have a history of fighting for the people that I represent, standing against massive cuts to public education, 
standing up to powerful insurance companies and payday lenders on behalf of the people I represent. I've stood for making sure that women are paid equally for doing equal work and that hardworking Texans in our state can earn a, a fair day's wage for an honest day's pay. I also helped pass the bill to hold accountable the use of our enterprise fund, which is meant to create jobs. My opponent, on the other hand, has fought to keep our schools underfunded. He has cozied up with the big insurance companies and the payday lenders and turned a blind eye when they've taken advantage of you. Worst of all, just recently we learned that he took over a million dollars from recipients of Texas Enterprise funds, funds that were not monitored by him to assure that they were creating jobs that were promised, and even worse than that, that he used the power of his office to cover up the fact that $170 million went out of that fund for people who didn't even fill out an application for them. <clears throat> Texans will have a choice in this election, and I want them to know that if they give me the privilege of serving them as governor, I will Thank fight you. for them every single day. Thank you. Attorney General Abbott, your closing statement. As your governor, I've been fighting for your liberty against an overreaching federal government. I've elevated the Texas child support system to be ranked number one in the nation, and I fought to defend the Ten Commandments monument on the Texas Capitol grounds, and we won. Now, I want to fight for the future of Texas as your next governor. Now, Texas is already number one in the nation for creating jobs. I will keep it that way by keeping taxes low and by making sure we don't let government grow too big. I will ensure that we build the roads and the water projects we need to keep Texas growing. And I will keep our community safe from the Rio Grande Valley all the way to the Red River. Texas is exceptional. And I am running for governor and asking for your vote to make it even better. I want to thank both of the candidates and my colleagues for joining us for this Texas debate tonight. Election day is November 4th. Good night. The Texas Debates Race for Governor has been brought to you by KERA, NBC5, Telemundo 39, The Dallas Morning News, the Texas Association of Broadcasters, other partners, and Texas Public Media Stations. The Texas Debates Race for Governor is presented by AARP, now offering a voter's guide online to inform voters about the issues and the candidates. The guide and more information are available at aarp.org tx.